Hey, everybody. Steve here, Local Level Podcast. I'm sitting here today with Zach Barrick, the first out trans actor in a Marvel movie. He was uh, in uh, the most recent Spider-Man <laughs> movie and then also Dead India, which is going to be coming out on Netflix as an animated uh, uh, show. Can you kind of explain a little bit of that? Uh, but first of all, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, super excited to join you. Um, and yeah, no, no, no. So Dead Endy is going to be coming out on Netflix 2021. That's the information I have. <laughs> it's yeah. the only information I have. And uh, yeah, it's going to be neat. It's a uh, animated show about um, some teens who have to more or less manage the demonic chaos unfolding at a theme park. And it's a really cool lens um, through which we kind of get to explore identity and, 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 you know, socialization between teens and how uncomfortable that can be, um, yeah. you know, using demons. So it's, right. it's kind of neat and interesting. And I think I'm really excited to see it come together and animated and all that. Yeah. And, you know, before we were recording here, we were kind of talking that, you know, I mean, you lost your voice, you were, you were doing some other things. <laughs> Tell yeah. us a little bit about, I mean, doing voice acting, that's kind of a different animal than being on camera. How, how has that been different than your experience on Spider-Man? Yeah, you know, well, so Spider-Man was my first job, actually. So I was interning at uh, the production company that does Grace and Frankie. I was interning with them just as like a, a, my truly my first industry job um, that was had anything to do with anything outside of acting. And my only prior job was a acting in a social work video that I have to pay for tuition to watch. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so I just kind of, I was pulling into work and uh, I stayed in LA to do this internship for the summer. And I got this call from a manager I'd been bugging and kind of <laughs> being like, if you ever need me for anything, you know, and um, yeah, that day I just like went home shaved so that I would look not in my twenties and yeah. <laughs> young enough to pull off being in high school. And I, went to the audition and, you know, it just sort of happened. It was my first job and it was, I was thrown in and I had no concept of what being on a set was supposed to look like. I didn't know what the etiquette was. So I was really lucky because I had lots of really cool people to sort of watch do it. Um, but yeah, voiceover is so different because you're, it, it honestly, it helps me tap in a little bit more to my, like where I started, which was high school theater and, 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 park center theater in the little town I grew up in sure. um, and it you're just like alone in a booth and typically I think you know I don't know I, I can't even speak to what the normal voiceover experience is because I've been doing it during the pandemic so my director my showrunner um, you know the creator the producers everybody's on zoom mm -hmm. I don't know how many people would have been there normally but um, it's just me and the engineer and and luckily everybody that works at the studio in LA uh, is doing like really perfect protocol. You know, they like open the door for you. You leave out a different entrance or a different door than you enter. You, right. So they're being super careful. So I don't know what the normal experience is like, but this has been really nice and personal. I mean, I get more emotional probably recording Barney in this, in the show than I have doing anything I've done because it's so personal being there alone. And also because the characters more or less my experience in life more than probably anything I've done, which is to yeah. say he's a little bit of a, a bumbling, dumb, <laughs> teen, <laughs> Jewish trans guy who's just trying to figure out, you know, romance and, you know, yeah, the world. a little selfish. I mean, and, and that's what I love about the show. So I guess the difference is it's it's very intimate. It's it's very, but it's really trying on your voice. And there's a lot of yelling because there's demons. So mm. I've, been, yeah. I've had to work on that. And it's, it's but it's been good because it's encouraged me probably also more than anything to invest in training with someone who knows how to yell without harming their voice and stuff like that. You know, right. Um, one of the other guys on the cast, he, he played Beetlejuice on Broadway, Alex Brightman oh, wow. and eight days a week. I watched his Tony's performance when we all got the cast list. Cause I was really interested in seeing, and he, um, you know, he says in his Tony's performance, he says, you know, I, I talk like this eight days a week and he's doing the Beetlejuice voice, which is crazy. Mm, and yeah. I was like, oh, I need to learn. I need to do, I mean, someone who can do that has trained, and prepared so well and I thought going into voiceover oh it's just like acting it's just like talking but it's not you know there's yeah. so much more 
and you have to invest so much in your voice. I mean, it's, and you have to protect it so dearly. So yeah. So last week I nearly lost it right before we did our <laughs> musical episode. <laughs> and, um, Bad timing. Grateful that we were still able to make this work. So thank you. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, and you, you bring up a point, I mean, with, cause to, to kind of make a bridge, I did phone sales, you know, just like talking on the phone yeah. is not voice acting, but it kind of is a little bit. Right. Right. And yeah, you know, it's, it's about getting that emotion across, um, with that, with that, you know, little bit of you, I mean, you have the animation and now I guess the question is, do they make the animation around your lines or do you do the lines around the animation? How does it work? What's the process as far as that goes? It's a really good question. <laughs> so what's interesting is I actually don't know that much about the animation project process mm -hmm. as of now. It's something I'm really curious about because I know the writer's room is constantly working and meeting and uh, working on, you know, whatever happens now and in the future and making things and, you know, they have to edit things, right? Like to make them culturally relevant and all that. Like I'm fairly certain that they're animating while we're going and that they mm -hmm. make edits um, after we record, but I honestly don't know. Sometimes they'll show us a little bit of animation. It's pretty like, it's not like done. It's not colored in. It's like the it's black like storyboards. Uh, yeah. Um, but we'll see the animatics going. So okay. they'll be like, Hey, you need to scream for X amount of time. This is what it looks like hmm. so that you can put some physicality in it because sometimes, you know, there's scenes where I'm like, you know, you know, the physicality of say, even something as simple as digging in your pocket, mm -hmm. you're kind of, hunched to your side sometimes when you really, you know, if you're wearing like skinny jeans or something, you might have to really dig or whatever it is, but it's so specific. And your voice does something so specific when you're doing it that it's sometimes really helpful to see the character doing it or, you know, seeing him, oof, you know, as opposed to getting hit in the stomach, which more like, oh, you know, like whatever right, right, it is. Right. And it's so helpful to kind of visualize it. But at the same time, I mean, it's part of your job. You read the script before you get in and you figure out what physicality you have to do. So I'm really grateful when I get to see the animatics. I think it's, I, the truth is that it's more for me being like, oh, I'm really excited to see this show come together. It sure. looks so freaking cool. Um, but I also, it is it is just like cool and helpful. And I think, and it, and it really puts it together in your brain because I imagine when I'm reading this so much of what's happening, but seeing it feels like a different, it's a different beast because it's like, A, it makes it feel a lot more real, yeah. which is making my brain feel crazy because I don't even know how to anticipate how it'll come together other than I'm positive it'll be good. Um, sure. And so, yeah, anyway, sorry to ramble, but yeah, no, that's it's great. No, it, I don't know the exact timeline, but it's, it's been interesting to kind of get to see snippets and know that it's, and the other thing is when we were doing the musical episode, they recorded us, they put a little camera on the booth with us um, for a uh, physical reference. So I think they do some animation based on how we act, Probably not often because unless it has to fit in the story, it has yeah, to fit yeah. into the story and, you know, the, right. in relation to the other characters, I would assume. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. I and, mean, you know, you say you're recording this all in a sound booth. So how big is the booth? Is it, you know, is it enough to where you can actually move around and, and kind of use your own physical movements to help you with the sound itself? Yeah. You know, um, it's more it's it's like a. Yeah, it's like the size of a small bedroom. It's it's pretty it's pretty spacious. The one we did the musical episode in was quite big. I was really confounded by being in that room because mm. I'm quite little anyway. And then it was just like me, and it's kind of a really really big room. Yeah, um, you know, and I and I knew it was because they needed to put like a camera on a tripod in there and all that. Um, and also, I think just whatever. I think that's probably where they do most group recordings and stuff typically. Mm. And who knows? But I have never felt so silly because I was really just like this I was in the center of the this like big room <laughs> kind right. of like you know singing my heart out but stand um, on the x right there <laughs> but depending on the studio they'll often have various rooms you know because they have x amount of clients in at once mm -hmm. so I'll be with a sound engineer in one room and someone will be in you know another one and I guess that's the beauty of soundproofing and all that it's something I could use my walls are incredibly thin here and you I do everything in my room. So sometimes I'm doing a voiceover audition and I'm like yelling in a, some crazy accent, like <laughs> in my room at like 3 a.m. My poor roommates are really kind and patient. Well, hopefully, hopefully once you, uh, once this launches and you're, you know, 
in the yeah. big leagues, you can uh, <laughs> invest in. <laughs> yeah, some, make make yeah. some investments, right? Um, right. Yeah. But no, I mean that's we skipped over a lot of things. I mean, you like you said, you got started on something that is coveted, and I mean, people work their entire careers, you know, for a long time to get in a in a role on a Marvel movie, and you know that was kind of your first experience. Um, tell us. You know, because we always have a conversation before we do these these interviews. And, you know, we had a long conversation about a lot of different things. And one of the things that was interesting is kind of how you, um, you know, walked into the audition. And you can you tell us that story about kind of like, you know, how you you walked into the wrong place and it was confusing and all that. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, um, I always think it's a really funny story. So I had very little experience in in-person auditions. I'd been to like four or five and like three of them were at the same building. Um, and so I got this call in the middle of the day, as I said, I ran over um, and I ran upstairs because I got confused by the building. I, actually, some man happened to be walking out of the building right when I was walking in. And I said, it's the casting office upstairs. And he said, yeah, but there's also one downstairs, <laughs> a separate right. agent uh, agency, I believe even. And uh, so I went upstairs and I s- sat in line and all there were like three guys or two guys ahead of me. And they were both really tall and blonde. <laughs> and I was like, this is an interesting casting agency. They're really going <laughs> in all to directions. Try different things. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and then they they were very like, you know, these tall goyish guys. And then they sort of they looked at me a little funny, even because I was truly the by like a bit looked different. <laughs> um and then uh I went in the room and the casting directors, I think, were trying to be polite and were like, you know. <laughs> okay, you know, the, you know, and yeah. they gave me the sides and I was like, oh, this isn't what I got in my email. You know, this looks different. And they were like, you're in the wrong audition, run downstairs. <laughs> Cause I started reading them wrong. And I went downstairs and, uh, they thankfully were running a little bit behind. So I wasn't late. Cause you know, they, they tell you, you know, to get an audition a little early, mm-hmm. you know, show you can be prompt and, you know, that way you give yourself a second to get composed and It didn't have much of a second to get composed, but the nice thing was I was working with probably some of the coolest casting directors, uh, Molly and Jason, who both work at Sarah Finn, who are really, really, really nice people and made it really comfortable. And I kind of had this thought where I was like, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. You know, I haven't gotten, I have had very few auditions. I haven't gotten a job yet. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to put everything out there and be myself and put myself into this as much as possible. And, you know, I had no clue what the size of the character was going to look like. I had no clue. I literally had no, and nothing but like a single page of dialogue to go Mm -hmm. off of. So I read it and like the weekend passed and they had told us that we were going to get, find out pretty soon because it was going to be a really quick turnover to get someone out there. Mm -hmm. And then um, I just kind of accepted it wasn't going to happen. And then on like the following, I think Monday, maybe I got a call from uh, Adam, who's now my agent and um, uh, this woman, Anne, and I, they were like, oh, do you want to tell him? And I kind of knew. And then, yeah. And I just had to pack up my apartment because I was about to move out <laughs> anyway wow. um, and let my internship know and get a passport overnighted in San Diego. <laughs> and uh, it was, you know, and it was, and there was this really interesting moment actually in San Diego that felt really very much like part of the process in my story in kind of a weird way as Mm -hmm. a, as a trans person in that, um, the guy gave me a lot of flack with my name change papers. Really? Um, you know, I had my new ID at this point. I had an ID with my name on it. I had all my documents. I had my, my actual court document that, you know, with my name change, cause you have to bring all this stuff in really just get through all the red tape. And the guy still gave me flack. I got an, I actually ended up getting a voicemail the next day when I went to pick it up from something like his superior being like, Oh, whoever was working with you was wrong. Like, this is not a limited time passport. You'll have this for this same amount of time. Everybody gets a passport. Like, mm-hmm. right. so it was really, it felt really essential to the trans experience in kind of a bad way. And in, in a sense, but like sure. just of the, like, there's something so bureaucratic that could get in the way of this really important moment. Right. Um, right. I'm something sure you so were and stupid. Yeah. That most people don't have to deal with. And then I just had to like power through it. And, uh, you know, it, it all worked out and I was flown to Europe. It was my first time in Europe and I got to do this really cool thing. So, yeah, I you mean, know, so it's, it's a very cool thing. And yeah. Especially so soon in your acting career. It I was out. able to, you know, do all that, make, yeah. make a trip. 
ask my job to be cool about it, you know. So we went to, uh, we started in England, all lived in this town called uh, St. Albans, which was really beautiful. I, when we first got out there, I remember being like, oh, we're not in London, that's weird. Uh, but it's because the studio we were at, it was funny enough, it's, it's a, I think it's like a Warner Brothers studio. Um, and they, it leaves in, yeah, and they, and they have, so they were shooting like a lot of DC stuff there. And I think Marvel was just kind of a guest. Um, but so we shot there and, and also on location, a few places in, in London as well. You know, we did something on the tower bridge and, uh, a bunch of places. I'm spacing now, yeah, but it was, it was it. neat. Cause I'd literally never been to Europe, uh, in my life. And so that was very cool. And then we went to Prague, which I've, my whole, I've always wanted to go to Prague. It's, always it's such it's, a cool city. Yeah. It's really um, beautiful. Yeah. And I, and I took a, you know, I took this really cool class when I was in college. It was one of my gen ed classes, uh, but it was, you know, cause I was a music industry major. So it was a music adjacent class and it was about uh, sort of the media and, and music and stuff that came out of world war two and, mm -hmm. and, you know, the Holocaust. And it was, we started some really beautiful stories. And so I got to go do some visiting of some sites that I'd heard a lot about. And um, that was really cool for me because I had, ne like I said, I'd never been to Europe. I never really got to do the like checking it out and saying, and Prague's really well preserved because their response to the Germans was much more covert yeah. than some of the more outright They didn't resistance. get and, Yeah. And I'm sure there are people who have lots of mixed feelings about it, but what they got fortunate enough to have was their city remained intact. Yeah. Um, and so there's so much that you can see there that's still around because of that. And there's a, there's a church in Prague that you can go into the basement and see where the soldiers who um, killed one of the high ranking SS officers hit. I don't know. It's very cool. I mean, it's yeah, dark, it's history, grim, sure. but I, you know, as a, as a young Jewish guy, you know, in, in Europe, it's, I sort of felt like a, an experience I was supposed to do, you know? And, and so right. I was having a really, a real go of it while I was there. I was doing my first movie and then also kind of doing some, 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 you know, self-searching, right, right. for lack well, of a better term. Well, that's yeah. kind of the theme, you know, I mean, the theme that, and that's why I wanted to just open with that, like, uh, you know, how you had these things happen, a lot of big things, but, you know, I mean, there was a lot of big things happening just in your life with the transition and, you know, coming to terms with your identity and, you know, kind of working, working that out yourself and with other people around you. That was one of the things that we, you know, really talked about. And, you know, I think it's a helpful uh, thing that, you know, you're, you're visibly out there, um, you know, talking about this, uh, you know, and, and, and showing that as a trans actor, um, you know, you can, you can make it in these things and, you know, have access, like you say, and, um, you know, it, it, it has to be really overwhelming, though, because, you know, I mean, for somebody doing this just, you know, in small town America or wherever, um, it's a it's a huge thing. But to throw all these other things onto it, all these experiences all at once, how do you deal with that? I, I've been, you know, as I said, I've been really lucky. I've had a lot of, um, you know, financial support historically from my family and, and then, you know, emotional support as well, um, just because. You know, I, I think we got all our family chaos when I out when I was in my teens in some capacity. I mean, it's more complicated than that. But you know, I, I, to sum it up, I think we. I'm fortunate enough to that when I came out as trans, while there were, I think, some bumps and bruises along the way that were really tough. And you know, I'm still those are resentments. I'm still going to be working out for of course, yeah. you know life. I think every trans person probably has that experience. Um, you know, where I am now, where I am when I started to fall into wanting to do performing and wanting to be an actor and wanting to get into media and all that and truly whatever capacity I could, mm -hmm. I um, I started to realize how important it was to have that sort of family thing because, you know, you just go really long stretches without working. You go really long, you know, depending on your situation and depending on where you are in your career, it can be really tough and mm -hmm you know, if, if all else fell apart, I would be able to talk to you about it. Um, Support structure. But it is, it's stressful, you know, and, and I think the big thing is like, when I got Spider-Man, I wasn't doing great, <laughs> you know, emotionally, yeah. I was in a tough place. My sophomore year of college, I was really struggling. Um, if I hadn't gone to do Spider-Man, I might have needed to buckle down and, you know, do some extra work therapeutically, just because I was, I was doing really, really poorly. And, you know, I talk a little bit, I did a the same year that I Spider-Man and all that stuff started happening. I 
got to do this really cool TEDx. Um, and I talked about it a little bit, but like, I was just really having to come to terms with the fact that this isn't a really linear journey and that that was something I struggled with because, you know, I had to transfer high schools because of whatever, because of stuff. And that felt like the moment when everything was supposed to go uphill. And then I came out as trans and I was like, okay, well then that's where this starts, you know? And I think I had this convoluted idea in my head that I kept doing these, you know, mental gymnastics to make it work, that there was some sort of linear journey and nice right. narrative I was going to follow, which I think just maybe comes from, you know, who, who, knew, who knows, you know, whatever. Everybody just think, expects that things are supposed to go in a nice, clean, cut and dry path, but that's just not how life works. Precisely. Yeah. And that like when you're trans or when you're queer, I guess there's some sort of pressure to have this really nice journey because it feels like you're compensating sometimes. Not always. And and, and I'm now I'm at a place where I'm so much I love myself so much more and I don't yeah. feel as much of that. You know, I'm so much more in a place of like I would not trade being trans and having the experiences I have as a trans person for anything, even if the acting and all that hadn't come with it. It hasn't been a perfect linear story, but I you know, when I got back from Spider-Man, that's when the journey began because I had to deal with how low it felt to not be stimulated every day, to not be in Europe anymore, right. to not know how big my role in the movie was going like, oh, to be. Wow. Yeah, so is... then when people asked me questions about representation, I didn't even know how to answer. You know, I yeah. didn't have a lot of information about, about what my future was going to look like. And I was already kind of in a dark headspace. And, um, you know, I made I had this incredible experience kind of at a weird, really rough part of transitional time like, in my in life. Every sense. Yeah, <laughs> in and every I, sense. Yeah. Right, exactly. And sometimes I even look back and wonder if I had been in the headspace I'm in now where I have some time of being a little healthier and frankly more, you know, focused on, you know, mental health and stuff like that, how different I would approach it. But, you know, there's no use in doing that and instead Dead India came along where I get to be this like young it's like, it sort of feels like a little bit of like fulfillment of this desire to explore what it would be like to have in a conversation with your younger self as a trans person. Yeah. I mean, I'm basically, it feels like I get to do that because there's the, I'm playing the 16 year old who is finding himself and is a little bit miserable at times with his family, but also really joyous and cool and like yeah. goofy and brave. And I just don't get to see that a lot in the media. I don't see a lot of happy go lucky. Well, that's, Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I hear you. Yeah. And it's unfortunate just and but it, it makes sense. I mean, everybody kind of needs to understand, you know, if you're not in it yourself, you want to, you know, paint it in some way to where it's clear for you as somebody looking at it from the outside. You know, everything that you just said, I can relate to, too. You know, I mean, I'm not I'm not trans, uh, you know, but I have also searched for you know, identity and, you know, felt like I was compensating for things at times, you know, like anybody would, right? I mean, that's kind of a, right. a, a nature, you know, kind of just a natural thing for anybody coming right. of age, I, I would imagine. And yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's something that there are, um, you know, extra burdens that you have to bear because it's something that kind of goes around uh, away from, you know, normal thoughts and, you know, kind of understandings that people have. It's this thing of, I think people really, I mean, that here, 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 the baseline is people really want to con contribute to the positive, you know, the positive parts of this. Right, and I think right. everybody re really wants to tell a good story. And I'll, and I'll, I, I, you know, for the most part, the people I encounter that are in, in the media and doing any kind of highlight or spotlight on this kind of stuff tend to have good intentions. And I, you know, I haven't had any particularly rough. The, you know, it's funny when when I, when the Spider-Man thing came out, I saw a lot of like weird side pages pop up on the Internet where they'd like, yeah, not know how to do pronouns and stuff. And like, you know, and they were confused about if I was trans masculine or trans feminine. And, you know, I do think that there's a desire to tell the story and to be part of the zeitgeist and have the conversation and not always know how, you know, for what it's worth. I've had mostly, if not all, entirely positive experiences doesn't mean there aren't times when I don't meet people who do feel maybe like they're a little confused or, you know, do feel like they're misguided and it does, you know, and I think it shows up more often in the auditions you get than anything kind of, where it's okay. like people really want to tell trans stories right now. And it's because people want to watch trans stories right now. I mean, um, you know, this documentary disclosure that came out on Netflix, I think I told you about it a little bit on the phone, but really talks really well about, you know, about how 
representation in the media is so important and so so directly connected to the experiences of real life trans people a and yeah. how they see themselves on television b and how other people learn about them and then therefore often treat them and um and it's just that thing of if you see more people that look a certain way and act a certain way or yeah. identify a certain way you know then you're more likely to have some sort of capacity to humanize and identify with them and you know sometimes it's that simple but the other part of it is like you know i get a lot of auditions that will read as really not accurate to the trans experience and you know i have to do i not have to i, I do all of them because i really want to work i love yeah, acting right, of course yeah i really really like acting but there are times when i wish i had the freedom of an actor who had more stability and, and more consistent work on camera and stuff like that because sometimes I, you know, I, I do get a little bit tired and I do get a little bit frustrated with people writing these stories that are completely unrealistic Just the and normal tropes so of, dark constantly. Yeah. And it, that like, you know, it is not unrealistic or unimportant to talk about the really horrible trials and tribulations of being trans in um, virtually any country yeah. uh, in the world. Um, you know, in Brazil, it's pretty impossible, you know, in here, it's pretty impossible. And there are some places where it's honestly, maybe even better. I know that that's true in some places as well. But I think that the common factor is that, you know, anti women, anti black beliefs permeate the world, because that's often where it stems from is like, people don't like trans people, because I think at the core of it, it's like we associate it with being more feminine. You know, I think that if you break it down, it all comes back to sexism and stuff like that. Um, so it's going to happen everywhere. But and I and it is so important to talk about that. But when when all we see on television is like, here's this vagrant trans person who can't enjoy their life mm. um, and is like constantly struggling or has more and more often it's like, here's this medical problem they're coming up against or, you know, and yeah. it medicalizes the That's experience a really in it. That's yeah. a really good point, actually. Um, yeah. One of the things that that you you often hear is like the transition and the, the you know like hormones and you know right. uh, consent and all that stuff. That's kind of like where it always goes, the like to the legal end of it, right? And it and it takes away from like the emotional part of like, hey, this is a human being that's like this is happening and this is like somebody this is who they are, you know. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, that's just another. I guess it's like people trying to write a story that is going to, you know, make people argue because that's yeah. how, how most things are. Right. Like, right. It's something that's supposed to get that emotional response out of the people that are watching and, you know, mm -hmm. at, at almost the expense of the, you know, person on the screen, um, right. you know, whether it's the actor or, you know, the, the character written. Um, and that's a really interesting thought that I think, and I have to I have to push back a little bit about where this kind of um, marginalization sometimes comes from. I think yeah. that it, it isn't necessarily out of um, a place of like discrimination. I think mm -hmm. sometimes it's it's uncomfortable just because it's something that you don't have experience with. There's almost a cultural transition that we're going through at this time. Do you feel like sometimes? you're pushed into things where you have to take a stand on certain things or, or not. I know we brought this up before, but what do you think about that? Yeah. Well, you know, to, just to say to your point, you know, I agree with you that I, I think there's such a difference in like where people are coming from. I think what I was saying is just like, I do think like at its core, like the reason that some people internalize this like fear of things they don't know is often from the same place. You know what I mean? Right. I, I don't think most people are coming into it being like, Oh, I hate women. And therefore I hate trans people. Yeah. But I think <laughs> the principles we internalize come so much from like where way, 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 way back when some of these things started being institutionalized or portrayed in media, you know, where they were coming from then. And then, you know, how that's trickled down into what we have now in, in a lot of ways or whatever, but you know, yeah. um, all that to say, you know, I do think that the tough position that a lot of people are put in by being anything in the media that isn't common. Yeah, <laughs> so like, of I think women often feel this way, even though it's becoming more, you know, women who play superheroes getting asked like weird questions about their suits and their bodies right. and stuff that the men aren't being asked. And I think, you know, even something as simple as that, when you're asked about that, you immediately become all of a sudden an advocate or, you know what I mean? Or, you know, you, mm -hmm. even if you don't mean to even, no matter how you respond, you're sort of 
in this position of I'm responding to a statement that is maybe unfair. I'm responding to a position that is unfair because I am a minority in this group or I am marginalized in this group or whatever it is. The tricky part or the part where I get hung up is for me, it's really easy to say, yes, I have a platform and yes, I should use it because it's a responsibility. Mm -hmm. And the other part of it is, is it fair? I, I ask as more of a rhetorical, I guess, for other people who I don't want to feel like they have to do it, you know, just because they want to act where I say, you know, is it fair to expect a person who exists to make a statement by existing? Right. Yeah. And, you know, it is tough for me to say the, you know, the onus is on you to do something just because you have a platform when I recognize you might have been battling your whole life. It's exhausting X, Y, and Z. But that being said, you know, we do live in a, we live in a time when X amount of followers and a blue check mark really goes a long way with how people listen to you. Yeah. And yeah. So maybe at the very least, I do feel a responsibility to not say anything irresponsible. There's just so much craziness that I think goes into that blue check mark, uh, you know, echo chamber type of thing where, you know, we have the, you know, this social media thing where everybody has this megaphone and they're blasting all this stuff at each other. And it's like, you know, it's not the real actual communication. Like if we're sitting in a, in a coffee shop, you know, and you're a table over for me, you know what I mean? Like, is it going to be, are we going to have that type of conversation? Am I going to, you know, that's not going to happen. You know, it's not, you know, and if it does like, that's great, I guess, but Mm -hmm. it's not a natural way of communicating. Every group has been kind of inflamed and, you know, um, you know, maybe just everybody's attacking each other. (laughs) You know, it's like, yeah, it's just crazy. Um, so I, I, I like to, to take a step back from that and just have these conversations with people because everybody has like their own story. Everybody has, you know, a best, I, I tell people like everybody has like a best selling novel or a blockbuster movie, like, and it's your mm-hmm. life, right? Yeah. Um, it's the things that, that happen in the, in the downtime that really make you who you are, yeah. you know, going on camera and, you know, talking about this particular subject or that particular subject is such a tiny little fraction of, who you actually are and what your life actually is. Um, right. And, you know, so when, when we're talking about Zach and we're talking about, you know, your, your life and the, the, the way that you deal with things and the way that you, you know, identify yourself um, and how you've come to that, how do you, how do you deal with the downtime? You, you touched on it a little bit, but how do you describe yourself? Who are you? You know, what, what is, what is Zach, right? Who is Zach? Yeah. You know, I, I'm a very unfocused person who's spending <laughs> most of my downtime learning to focus. That's that's honestly like at the core of myself. That's how I feel sometimes. But I think from an emotional standpoint, even and you know, we could get into the I don't know enough about this, but I know there are some people that, you know, tied there's so much tied together between ADHD and, you know, your experiences with trauma or whatever it is. And I guess I'll just say like, um, yeah, I feel like I spend most of the time trying to organize thoughts. Mm-hmm. Um especially about emotions, because I'm a highly avoidant person. And, you know, that takes lots of forms. And sometimes that takes work forms. You know, sometimes I think I feel insecure about being an actor, just so I can be reassured. Hmm. And sometimes I feel like I'm anxious, just so I can be reassured, you know, anxious about X, Y, and Z, just so I can be reassured. And, you know, really good example, you know, my mom's a doctor. Um, I'm sure there are times when I get like a tickle in my throat and I'm super neurotic and I'll just text her and be like, is this normal? Especially during COVID. <laughs> right, I'll right. be like, hey, I can still taste, but like my throat, it's just, <laughs> she'll be like, fine. And I think I wonder sometimes if the anxiety even just comes from wanting to be able to text that and get a response. Hmm. So my point being, I think who I am at my core is a person who's looking to be reassured and a person who's looking to be focused and organized emotionally, mentally, whatever. Um, and and I just say that because I think that that's such an, it's exactly what you were saying, which is like being trans aside, I think that's such a universal experience of 2020, but also just maybe even the past four years or the past eight years, you know, of the the country that or the world that we live in personally evolving and changing to have certain conversations or very different looking conversations with very different layers of nuance about yeah. identity and personal experience and mental health or whatever. But for me, I mean, where that's sort of culminated is being a person who really wants to be my best self. Um, of course. And 
and that is just so much more complicated than I thought it was going to be. It sounds a lot you know like I mean? me. I do. I know exactly yeah. what you mean. I think I think a lot of people do. I think. Yeah. I think that's a and story that a lot of people have to to tell. I mean. Yeah. It's um. You know, I, I think you know, and I don't even know. I'm just a guy talking, and uh, you know, so we're we're just having a conversation. And I, right. It's like. It's just unfortunate, though, that there's there's just so much stigma m- around identities of people, like pointing finger at other people. That I right. think that that for a person to make a determination about who they are is final, right? Yeah. Like it's not a debate, like whether this should be that or this is okay right. or that's you know. And it's I can see why that would make somebody neurotic, you know. Mm-hmm. Just just the, you know the emotions aside and all that. Um, I don't even know where I'm going with this, but I just, it's, it's interesting to me. You know, it's interesting to me that people think that this is such a different outside thing, but we're just people. We're all just different people. We're all individuals. And, you know, so I don't know, um, (laughs) get, getting off of that a little bit. Let's talk about some of the things that, um, you've done to get to, your greatest self, you know, uh, obviously nobody's ever, nobody ever gets there, but it's a journey. Yeah. Right. So like, yeah. you know, what are some of the ways that you've been able to tame that, you know, neuroticy going on and, you know, the neuroticies right. in your head and, um, you know, feel better. What are some of the rituals that you have? What are some of the things that have been working for you? Yeah. You know, so yeah, I think it looks different for everybody. You know, I, I just can't advocate for therapy kind of enough. <laughs> You know, being in my 20s now, I, it's a really hard transitional time. Mm-hmm. And so much of your past, you're, you're so alone with so much of all your feelings. Yeah, <laughs> of course. And, you know, I think quarantine's unique because you're so much more alone <laughs> with your feelings than right. anybody might be on any given day. It took sticking with the same person for a really long time for me to, like, make genuine progress. And it took, frankly, three and a half years, three years or so before I started seeing real results, but I guess it's just consistency and it's hard because. Like if, like if when you're acting, okay, for instance, mm-hmm. if you're, if you're taking on a role uh, of a character and you have um, a clear understanding of what this character is and who that character is, does that put you in a place that of comfort? Does that put you in like a, a place where, okay, I am this now? Like, does it, is that a calming thing or is that something that overcomplicates things? How does that work? Where it's like, if it's written and it's a story that I don't know anybody that's trans that could relate to, and it feels really contrived for the purposes of plot, Mm -hmm. I find that difficult because then I really feel like I have to lean into something that, I mean, it's my job and I'll do it. And I, and I, and I'm able to say, I know what it feels like to feel this general feeling that this person would be feeling and I can apply Mm -hmm. it here. And that, you know, that's how I get it done. But I think it feels so much better when you're reading stuff that is true to your experience or just something that feels more real um, and authentic and, and it definitely helps, but you know, I I think the best thing for me is, and say with Barney, for example, like, you know, he's 16 or something like that. And Mm -hmm. I'm not, (laughs) and you know, I have almost 10 years on him. I have about nine years on him and it doesn't mean that I forgot what it felt like to be so nervous and anxious and not in the way I am now where it's, I'm concerned with the world at large, but in the way where I'm concerned with what this person I'm romantically interested thinks of me Hmm. or what my relationship with my parents will look like, or, you know, X, Y, and Z. And, you know, I think it really helps to tap into that for sure. And I definitely think, and I can imagine there's some people that, um, and and this does happen for me. There are times when I get emotional when I was, there were a few days when we were working on dead India where I was in the booth and it's so intimate and alone. I was, Truly, like I welled up, even though, you know, when you're in voiceover, the way that you do crying and stuff is so different than on camera. And like, yeah, you know, nobody sees me crying yeah. <laughs> in the voiceover. Nobody sees it. Um, but it happened. And it's because there's so much to dig into there. And it, mm. and it makes me feel so much more involved in Barney. I've had really positive experiences interacting with the casting directors when that's happening often. I'm not saying I, you know, rely on my charm or anything, yeah. but I definitely think that when you get to show them who you are, and I don't think it's because they're, you know, seeing you as a person outside of the character, they're seeing you as the character and then, you know, whatever. But I do think it's important to show people who you are and you get to do that a lot less 
when you're doing on camera auditions because you just get to introduce yourself and then you do the audition, um, which means you just have to then do a really good job, which is good. And I think that is how casting often just works is you right. just, it's whoever's best for the job gets it. And that's important. Um, but I miss kind of interacting with people because I definitely think it's a nice warm up almost. Yeah. It's gotta um, be so hard doing this on zoom. It's hard doing this on zoom, honestly. Yeah, no, 100%. And, uh, I think that like, I haven't been that busy during quarantine. Unfortunately, things have been pretty slow on my end and I, yeah. it's a bit of a bummer and a lot you know, of people it's and it's just how things have shaken out. Yeah. Um, but it does make me really hungry for more. Like it makes me, when I do get an audition, it makes me want to leave everything out. Um, you know, and I've always wanted to do that. And Spider-Man was the first evidence I had that that works, that when you like put your whole heart into right. just a scene, even if it's just like three lines of reacting, you know what I mean? That it goes a long way and it, it shows people what your capacity is, you know, and, and then it's up to you to then carry that on to when you actually have the chance to do it. Yeah. So, you know, it is tough because sometimes you get, it's just this little window and you just have to put your heart out. And I'm not going to lie and say that like every, I've left out every audition. Good cause no, I just of have course it. not. But I you would just imagine. know, you just know yeah. when you did good. And, you know, there have been some where I felt good. And, you know, after Barney, um, or after my callback for Barney, you know, as I said, I had very little voiceover experience at this point. It's my first animated series. It's my second project ever. Yeah. Voiceover. And, um, my like fifth ever as an actor um or something like that um so you know it's i remember going to the callback and i had literally no clue how well i did because it was such a different medium mm -hmm. but i knew i put my heart into it and i knew how much i cared about the character and i knew i had read the comics and that i like did my research because it was important to me and because i yeah. really really wanted the job um and really wanted to get to play this kid and so you know it is just about like working your hardest and doing your research and yeah. Laying it out, but it's, it's tough and it can be, sometimes you leave and you're like, that felt really bad. I feel like, I feel like trash, you know? Well, you, I, I mean, yeah. as I've done stand up and uh, the only experience I could really equate it to, because stand up has helped so much with auditions. Cause yeah. it's just like, once you, when you, it's so much more vulnerability when you're writing something and putting it out there kind of in a way, cause it reflects on you almost. Mm -hmm. When people don't like your jokes, it's like tough. And <laughs> it's only yeah. really, I've only yeah. had one like, horrendous night um and it was at this like <laughs> coffee shop place that's in next to usc where i was going to school and it's it's called nature's brew and it was just like i was doing my normal set which is about like trans stuff and it just no one got it and it was so <laughs> so i was like i'm never doing Devastated, this again yeah <laughs> I, need to quit. I should never perform and there have been auditions where I felt that kind of gut feeling too but it is just about remembering that it's that one audition and that like there have been so many it's so much about like relativity and remembering that like you've had experiences that don't feel like that and it's yeah. so tough sometimes to access that but it's weirdly like an, an acting exercise almost mm -hmm. to yeah. leave an audition that didn't feel good and still know that you can do this for a living because it's it's that thing of like you're faking it till you make it but you're not because the feelings are real and you know you've had them before yeah. but you have to access them when they don't feel accessible it's a wrong and a letter acting more yeah. or less is so right you know yeah definitely no the stand-up thing is is uh i can imagine is a, a good way to Ex, you know, experience that terror of, you know, bombing on stage and getting, yeah. you know, and then persisting until you succeed, right? Like right. getting back up, brushing yourself off and just moving forward. Persisting and then doing things that you're not comfortable with. Because when I auditioned for my voiceover agency or when I, you know, met with them and all that, I, I just was like, they're going to hate me. Oh my God, I don't have this. And um, it's just about, I think it's just about like when you don't want to do it the most, probably the time you have to do it the most. Um, now that's one of the places I enjoy working so much, you know, and I still want to do on camera stuff so much, like, you know, that is so much my career and hopefully will continue to be part of my career. Yeah. Um, you know, you can, you can only do as much as, in, as is presented to you and, you know, not to be corny, but like you, as much as I want to say, like work really hard and prep and stuff like sometimes the opportunity comes at a weird time you know I was pulling into as I said my internship as like probably the worst intern ever with <laughs> very little experience working in a production office probably doing making things a lot harder even sometimes than easier for the people that I was working with who were kind enough to give me some industry experience 
And I got the call for Spider-Man and it was like, and it led to all these other amazing things. I wouldn't have Dead Endia without it. I wouldn't have done my TEDx without it. I wouldn't have gotten to do all these cool, amazing things. I wouldn't have gotten to work on Transparent um, because I wouldn't have had an agent and I wouldn't have had this support. And so it is just about like, you know, I really wanted to go home that summer. I was kind of, like I said, I was in like kind of a dark place. It was really hard. And I, part of me was just like, I want to resign for the summer and not engage with this thing I'm so neurotic about, which is my career. And then I'm really glad I did because um, when I most didn't want to, it doesn't mean I'm saying don't, you know, if you need a break, don't take a break. You should absolutely take a break. But I do think if it's coming from a place of fear, if it's coming from something a little more superficial is just, I don't want to get rejected. I don't want, I just want to be reassured right now. Mm -hmm. It is important to practice reassuring yourself and truly just like reciting to yourself that it is okay and that you're good at this because like, I internalize it takes a while, but you do internalize it yeah. and, and affirmations are so important and being kind to yourself is so important, but it's also about pushing through fear and it's not easy. Um, and it's super uncomfortable, but you just do it because you, if you want to do this bad enough, then you, you know, you do it. And I think as trans people, my, my little piece of advice is, you know, be authentic and, and don't do anything you're not comfortable with. Cause that's, that's the, probably the worst thing is looking back and saying, I really wish I hadn't done that. Um, you know, it doesn't mean don't try new things, but you know, nothing that's exploiting Mm. your identity, nothing that's because you want a job so badly that, you know, you put aside things that make you truly uncomfortable. So it's striking the balance of of taking risks and fighting through fear and not compromising things that are like truly uncomfortable and unsafe for you, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I do. That's, uh, that's great advice. I mean, for anybody, I think, um, you know, a lot, a lot of things, it's a lot of, a lot of perspective that you have that, um, you know, it's helpful, hopefully for people that are watching this when you're, uh, you know, a huge, uh, blockbuster, uh, you know, Hollywood actor, um, (laughs) years from now, you're going to watch this and be like, I can't believe that I went on that guy's (laughs) show. Um, but no, I really do appreciate it. Uh, I really appreciate your time and your story. Thank you for having me. Um, This was, uh, this was a lot of fun and I, and I'm, it's really nice to meet you. I've listened to all of Max's sessions with you so i'm really glad he put us in touch this was fun definitely well yeah everybody uh zach barrick uh <laughs> brother of max barrick um and uh you know it's a, it's a real pleasure so thanks again yeah. and i'll be talking again soon